Welcome to Belladonna, a gathering for grieving women. For those of you who don't speak Italian, like me, Belladonna means beautiful women, and that's who you are. Mother's Day is this weekend, and it's a beautiful day to celebrate the beautiful women in our lives, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, our aunts, our grandmothers, our friends, all of those who've been like a mother to us. I mean, we pull out all the stops at Mother's Day, flowers and cards and gifts, balloons, brunch, lunch, chocolate. And for millions of women, it's a day of joyful recognition, affirmation, and celebration. But it can also be a very complicated and gut-wrenching day if you've experienced grief, loss, and disappointment around motherhood. For some of you, you're freshly bereaved. This is your first Mother's Day without your child, without your baby, without your mother or your grandmother. It's the first time Mother's Day has rolled around since your miscarriage, your unsuccessful fertility treatment, since you placed your child for adoption, since there's been an estrangement between you and your family. And for some of you, it probably took every bit of resolve that you could muster to even tune into this event. Your tears are close to the surface, or you're numb, your heart just a bit frozen by grief so deep, you don't even have words or emotions that can describe it. Maybe you've grown a thick layer of protection over your heart because you haven't yet had the opportunity to become a mother and you've just gotten used to toughing it out the second Sunday of May every year. The complications around motherhood can make some women feel less than beautiful, less than fully a woman, less than a complete and whole person. Not every woman watching feels that way, but I know many that do. And Belladonna is for each of you to remind you that you are a beautiful woman, just as you are. And this event is to create a safe place for you to bring all of your feelings and to join other beautiful women in shared sorrow and hope. Isaiah 61.3 summarizes our prayer for you. To all who mourn in Israel, He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. During our time together, you're going to hear from beautiful women who have experienced grief around motherhood. And each type of loss has its own language, its own complexities, and its own unique pain. And because each woman's loss is her own, she's going to have her own way of expressing it. And we're not here to evaluate someone else's pain or loss or compare our losses to theirs. I'm not saying that my grief is like your grief or that yours is like mine. We're not comparing whose sorrow is worse. We're just here together saying, we hurt, we mourn, and we need comfort from God and from each other. Some of the places that we're going to go in our stories are delicate and tender. Grief is sacred ground. Because of that, the organizers have spent a lot of time praying and processing together. And you guys, the truth is, we might mess up. We might say something that is triggering or insensitive or offensive. And if so, please forgive us ahead of time. We really have spent a lot of time trying to be as sensitive and compassionate and tender with your hearts But because we're attempting to include so many types of losses and struggles, we might get it wrong. Please know it's not our intention. You're going to hear some songs from those who have suffered and those who are compassionate allies of mourners. And my prayer is that each song you hear will speak hope and comfort to your heart. Let me tell you my story. Mother's Day used to be one of my favorite holidays every year. I loved the way my husband and my children pampered me and spoiled me. And it was always fun to see the competition at church for the bouquets of flowers for the oldest mother. But now, it's a mixed day for sure. Because of deep grief that combines with deep joy that I get to be with my surviving children and grandchildren. But it sure creates a strange mixture of emotions. And I'll bet it's that way for some of you as well. This is the first Mother's Day without my precious mom, who died February 28th after 10 years of living with Alzheimer's disease. She died in my home while in hospice care, and I miss her so much. 
I don't know what it's like to be in this world without her. She was 96 and I'm 66. So that means for a very long time, my mama has been a part of me. Alzheimer's is a cruel disease, causing a person to slowly die by inches. It's this incremental decline that is heart-wrenching to watch. And while she knew me to the end most of the time, the mother who mothered me disappeared years ago, leaving someone who looked and talked like my mother, but who only occasionally acted like my mother. Still in her dying days, her whole being lit up with exuberant joy the time I said to her, Mama, you're going to see Jesus very soon. She gasped and she raised her hands toward heaven. She said, the king, the king is coming. I'm so grateful that she loved God and his word. She spent her life loving him and telling him so. Mama, soon we'll be together again. It's my eighth Mother's Day without my son, Matthew, who took his life April 5th, 2013. That was the hardest day of my life. Even though Matthew had lived with serious depression for more than 20 years, nothing prepared me for the day he died. I collapsed to the ground where I sobbed for hours, unable to move completely unable to absorb the fact that he was gone. In many ways, losing a child has altered me forever. There is Kay Warren before April 5th, 2013, and there is Kay Warren after April 5th, 2013. I can never go back to the person I was before Matthew died. That woman, that person is gone forever. When people ask me, how are you? How have you survived the suicide of your son? I've struggled to find words that could adequately describe how I'm doing. I finally settled on this phrase. I'm wonderful, terrible. Because you guys, there is so much in my life that is wonderful. I mean, truly wonderful. I have a great husband. I have two surviving children. I have five amazing grandchildren. I have work that I love. I have a church that I love. I have friends that I adore. But there is also a terrible gaping hole where Matthew is supposed to be. And nothing and no one can ever fill that hole. But I'm learning to live with both of those things being true. It's taken a really long time for me to be able to say things will never be the same, but they can be good again. So beautiful grieving women, I can tell you this for certain. Life might not look the way you thought it would. Things might not ever be the same way it was at a certain point, but life can be good again. And it is with those two truths that seem to compete with each other, sorrow and hope, that I welcome you to Belladonna. God, I pray for my sisters. I pray for those for whom this is the freshest loss. They are still on the floor. They are, their hearts are as cold as stones and they have no words. I pray for those who have lost for those who have tried to conceive, for those who have longed for a family, for those who have longed to have connection with family. And all of that feels like it's in ashes on the ground. May this time that we spend together be the beginning of the belief that life can be good again and that you will give beauty for these very strange ashes and that you will put a song in our mouth when right now, all that we can find are bitter words. Pray, God, I pray for our hearts. I pray for the tender hearts of women who are here listening. I pray that they'll walk away feeling closer to you and closer to each other. And in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. We have had quite a significant loss, as I know many people have uh, during this season for a number of different reasons. But it was just about four months ago or so that my mother, um, who is the mother not only to me, but my three siblings, she went home to heaven to be with the Lord. 
it was only about nine months before that that we found out that there was a very rare um, cancer that had sort of ravaged her body, kind of appeared out of nowhere and was everywhere all at once. And we just did everything that we could to support her and walk with her to do whatever we could medically and through holistic remedies to try to beat back the disease. Um, but ultimately, despite the fact that we were praying for the Lord to do a miracle and to eradicate the disease, ultimately, it took her to be with heaven, it took her to heaven to be with the Lord. The great thing is, though, that God answered our prayers still. And I know it sounds a little bit cliche to say that, but I feel that. I've heard other people say it, and now I really feel that. I feel that there were only ever two answers to our prayers. And it was either that she was gonna be healed here on earth, or that she was gonna be healed and in heaven. The answer was always gonna be yes. It was either gonna be a yes here on earth or a yes in heaven. My brother preached at her uh, funeral services and eulogized her. And that's something that I will never forget that he said in her eulogy, that either she was going to be with family or she was gonna be with family. Either way, it was a yes. Either way, because of heaven and because of Jesus, we win. And I've just heard that before from other people. But you know, once you experience your, experience your own losses and experience your own set of difficulties and pain like this, it's not until you experience it that you start to be able to put a little flesh and feeling to what you've only heard other people say. In my mom's last several hours, um, in fact, if I could say this one day, whenever I take my last breath, I hope it is at least in some way similar to the way that my mother spent her last couple of hours. She was um, laying in her bed. I was literally sitting behind her. Um, she was laying in my lap. My other sister was laying right in front of her on the side of the bed. Um, my dad, um, my mom's husband of 49 years, was laying right next to her, sort of leaning over her on this side. And then Anthony and Jonathan, our two brothers, were standing right beside the bed right here. She was literally, literally incubated by her family in those last two hours. We played worship songs over her and for us as we listened to a celebration of the victory that we have in Jesus as she took her, literally took her last breaths. And we were there to witness that very last one. It's a moment I'll never forget, a sacred moment that I'm so glad that the six of us got to share with each other. How have I dealt with my grief? That's one of the questions that um, Ms. Kay put down on the paper for me to answer. And it's a tough question because to be honest with you in our family, it's been one thing after another that has happened in such quick succession. We've actually had seven losses in about two years. And then right on the heels of my mother passing away, I had to have a major surgery. And now with everything that's happened in our whole world, globally, the coronavirus, I don't know that I've had a chance really to process fully yet, and I know it's gonna be an ongoing experience, but I don't, I would have to describe my grief right now as a little bit numb. I feel a little bit numb. I don't know if that's healthy. I don't know if that's the way I should feel. I have no idea yet, um, but it's still pretty fresh and I feel just a bit numb as I try to work really hard with my siblings to keep moving forward, to keep taking care of each other and to keep taking care of our dad who now is really the center of our attention as we make sure that he knows that we're here for him and we wanna take care of him in the way mom would, making sure he's eating healthy and, and all those good things. So our time and our energy is kind of consumed right now with everything that's happening on, in the globe and then everything happening in our homes and then with our dad. So I feel a little bit numb and now I can understand when people say that they feel that way after losing somebody, that you're not sure you're processing it right or not. I don't know. But I bet that this too is gonna to be a part of the grieving process that the Lord is allowing me to go through for reasons I can't quite see right now, but that I will be able to later on. Either way, I'm grateful. And one thing that my mom said that I will never forget, she said to us several times throughout the nine months that we shared with her at the end of her life. She said to us, whatever you do, stop and smell the roses. As you go through life, just keep pausing to smell the roses. In fact, she would say often if she could go back and do some of her years again, she would have done that more frequently. She would have just paused to take in the beauty of life, to celebrate her family, to just rest. So that's what a lot of us in our family are doing now because my mom sort of encouraged us to. 
And every time I see a rose, I'm reminded of that principle. And we only get one opportunity, to, one opportunity to walk through this life. And so I'm gonna stop and smell the roses some more, spend some time with my husband, my dad, my siblings, my kids, just sort of engage in each season of life, knowing that it's gonna change. We're gonna move into other seasons and we're gonna miss what we could have enjoyed while we were in it if we would have just taken the time. Hi, my name is Don Cherie Wilkerson. I live in Miami with my husband, Rich, and my two sons, Wyatt and Wild. And we pastor a community named Vu Church. I'm so grateful to be a part of Belladonna, and I'm grateful for the vision and the compassion of Kay Warren. I know that Mother's Day can be a very tender, sensitive day in the hearts of so many women because I've been there 
For eight years, my husband and I, we went on an infertility journey. We've been married for 13 years now, but for eight of those years, well, I experienced a lot of Mother's Day where you walk into church and you feel like there's a spotlight on your empty arms and you're fully aware that the prayers that you've prayed haven't been answered yet. And it's in the waiting that I believe that we discover who God is and who we are really like no other season. As I look back over the eight years of of waiting, of going to countless doctor's appointments, tears, lots of fall, lots of tears that fell. Well, if I'm honest, I wouldn't take one of those days back because the waiting season when entrusted to God can establish something permanent in you that you carry into every single season after it. And waiting seasons, well, we've heard it said lots of times that it's not a wasted season. But what I would encourage you with is a scripture that I leaned on a lot. Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Often when we're waiting, it feels like we're at a stop sign. It feels like nothing is happening, that God is not moving, but... I discovered that when I can't see God moving, it's probably because He's doing a very deep work inside of my heart. And He did that over those eight years. It took me a full year to even tell my parents that we were walking through infertility. I was so insecure and afraid to be labeled with that label of infertility. It took me six years to share it publicly. What I discovered six years in, and I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit who's patient with us and teaches us. His timing is perfect. But what I discovered at the six year mark when I decided to open up my heart and share what we were walking through is that the moment I opened up my heart and shared was the moment I had an army, a company of women and men surround us in prayers and love. And those same people that prayed with me for another two, three years that God would bring a miracle. They were the same people on the other side of the miracle celebrating when our first son, Wyatt, was born. I never dreamed that simply by being honest about what we were walking through, not overthinking it, that there would be so many people to celebrate with on the day the miracle came to pass. I just wanna encourage you, don't be afraid or intimidated to share what you're walking through with those around you that love you. Don't be afraid to process. And don't be afraid to have resolute, bold faith. I noticed that there were a lot of chat rooms and a lot of chatter around infertility that centered around negativity on the burden that it was of the doctor's appointments and the annoyance of having a calendar for your love life with your spouse or the annoyance of your spouse not understanding it. I had to back away from all those conversations and go, you know what? The conversations I'm gonna have are with people that believe the best in me, that call me to radical generosity with my life and radical love to live with arms that are open I had to get out of my head and choose that those eight years weren't going to keep me from going to baby showers or celebrating other people when their miracle came to pass. That I could go into a party and not be thinking about myself the whole time or what everybody was thinking about me and not feeling awkward, but I could grab the closest baby and get some cuddles while I had him. I could celebrate the people around me and it was freeing to get out of my head and just choose to love with all my heart in the now. See, we're not even promised tomorrow. The only gift I have is today. So I gotta live with a heart that is open. And that's what I discovered in the eight years. It wasn't easy, but it was worth the journey. And this Mother's Day, I'm praying for you. We serve a God that does miracles. But one of the greatest miracles that our God does is that he places us in community. That's what Belladonna is about, that we would journey together, that we would be honest about the suffering that we're walking through and know that we are not alone. God sees you, we see you, and the best is in front of you. I truly believe it. Our God is a healer. 
our God, well, at the end of the day, I had to come to a place in those eight years of infertility, going, God, whether I hold a baby in my arms or not, you are my treasure. And you are more than enough to fulfill my life and to satisfy my soul. I wanna pray for you, Lord. I thank you for my sisters. God, whatever country they live in, whatever city holds their address, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill their hearts with hope for today, comfort, peace, that you would satisfy their soul. Lord, I thank you for Belladonna and the hope that it's bringing to hearts and homes around the world. I pray that you would continue to bless it. And Lord, that you would continue to propel the message of life in you forward. God, we trust you. We love you. Do a miracle in the hearts of the daughters that you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And from Miami, sending so much love. Hi, I'm Karen Hacker. And I struggle with Mother's Day. I have four kids. Two are here on earth and two are in heaven. So it's kind of a mix of emotions. I am tremendously joyful and thankful for my two kids here, but I do miss my other two that aren't here. I also miss my mom and my mother-in-law and my sister, who was an amazing mom. They were all amazing moms. And, um, you know, Mother's Day, it should be a joyous, beautiful, wonderful celebration. But for many of us, it's a hard day. I lost my son, Matthew, my first child. Um, he lived for three days. I found out in my seventh month that he probably wasn't gonna make it. And those were the most difficult couple months and um, a year or two years after we lost him that um, I could have ever imagined going through. And I was desperate to get pregnant again. After holding him for those three days and his heart stopped, I thought mine did too. Um, didn't think I could ever be happy again until I held another one of my babies. And a year after I lost Matthew, I got pregnant again. And um, unfortunately, six weeks later, I miscarried that baby and all the grief and loss and feelings swirled up again. And um, one thing one of my doctors told me was, you're not ready to get pregnant again until you're ready to go through another loss. I thought, how on earth can you prepare yourself for another loss? I didn't want to hear that at all. Um, but for me, my desire overcame my fear and we tried again and got pregnant again. And uh, I have my son, Ryan, who is an amazing, amazing, godly man. <laughs> he just recently got married, but um, he is such a blessing in my life. He's now 27. And I also have a daughter, Avery, who's 25, and she brings so much joy and fun into my life. I don't know what I would do without the two of them. Um, and I'm so thankful for, for my losses because they made me who I am today. I don't know that I would have had the compassion or care or I wouldn't have been helping others through their losses for the last 25 years had it not been for Matthew and our other baby. And for that, I am truly grateful for their little lives as short as they were. They were very, very meaningful and big. And just know that God does have a plan in your pain and a purpose, and he will use it if you let him. Hi, I'm JJ, and this is my husband, Dave, and I'm so honored to be a part of this event today. I'm a singer-songwriter, and for years, listeners have been asking me to write a song about miscarriage, and for the longest time, I, I didn't want to because it's not my personal story, and I just, didn't want to say anything that would dishonor all of the women who have had that experience. But but then I had a conversation with a songwriter friend of, of mine, and he said, 
that our job as songwriters is to put words to the human experience and and how writing a song about this would be um would be honoring to to all of the moms who have lost babies and so on the way to that songwriting appointment i wrote this poem and i wanted to read it to you you are the answer to the prayers i prayed and the childhood games i played pushing baby dolls and wobbly wheeled strollers. You are the news I celebrated. That little blue line exclamation point, signaling the commencement of a barefoot dance of joy on the cool tile floor. You are the heartbreak I felt first in my abdomen, now spread to my soul, gone before you were here, silent before you had a chance to cry. And now I cry your tears for you for us. The whole world weeps for the loss of you. The songs you will not sing, the laughter we will not hear, the embrace we will not feel from your arms. And I will never hold you. <laughs> I will never hold you in my arms, but forever in my heart. <laughs> never put Polly Bart. I will always, always be your mother. And then we turned it into a song <laughs> that we're going to attempt to sing for you right now. You are the answer to the prayers I pray. And the hope in childhood games I play. Pushing baby dolls and strollers and dreaming of who you would be. You are the news I celebrated That little blue line exclamation Got me dancing in my bare feet And I couldn't help but sing You will always be
Some of the losses we've heard about so far are more obvious. Losing a child, or a baby through miscarriage, or being unable to conceive a child, or as Priscilla and I have shared, losing a mother. But some of the other grief points around motherhood might not be quite as noticeable, and therefore they remain hidden and unacknowledged. They're no less real and painful. I'm thinking of those women who place their baby or child for adoption. I'm thinking of women who've had abortions. I'm thinking of women who are estranged from their families due to conflict or abandonment. I'm thinking of single women who would very much like to be married and have children, but for whom that has not yet happened. These women don't always feel like belladonna, like beautiful women. But I want you to know, we see you today, and we add your sorrow to ours. I want you to listen to Latasha Morrison's story. Just to give you a, a glimpse into my personal life, I am single, I am have never been married, and I don't have any children. And so as we approach Mother's Day, I know that can bring a lot of anxiety for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, but I want to specifically talk to um, those who are single and maybe um, those who can relate that have never been married or maybe you were married but you're no longer married. Um, working in the church, I tend, as I kind of grew up in ministry, uh, we tend um, to focus on making sure that um, the students that we're working with are celebrating their parents or doing something special for Mother's Day, giving out roses or having a program or having someone speak, you know, so that um, for a lot of years, my focus um, tended to be in that um, way as it related to ministry. But as I've gotten older, um, that day has, has changed. Um, I think sometimes if I'm just on Honest and really vulnerable. Um, as you, as I've gotten older, you can feel a little bit of some kind of way, you know, wondering like, okay, God, when is, you know, am I ever going to have children or all these different things? But I think one of the things that has has really been a reality me, reality for me, for the last few years, have been um, that. It doesn't mean that I have to birth the child to be mothering. And I think that's important for those that are single. There's a lot of children um, and um, that I have mothered over the years um, that celebrate me. And so what I would really want to for you to tap into um, this Mother's Day is, you know, is how can I celebrate other women? And one of the things that I do is because when I'm thinking, feeling um, this way, I think about other single women and maybe how they feel, especially single women who have children, who um, who are not married, or single women that need the reality of, you know, you're still mothering in so many ways, whether it's your godchildren, whether you have nieces and nephews, whether you have neighbors that you're take, you take up time with, um, you are mothering. And so one of the things that I do at Mother's Day is I make it, um, you know, a habit each year that some of the single mothers in my family that I send them a note, a message or a Starbucks gift card. And this also um, be doing that for others. Um, also helps really fill that void um, that I have in, in my life. And then also, um, I know a lot of women are not in this situation where they can celebrate their own mom, but I'm grateful um, for to have a mother that is still here, that is still um, coherent, that's in good health. And I know everybody doesn't have that. And so I look at, um, you know, different friends of mine who maybe lost their mother at a young age. Um, my mom, lost her mom when she was my age. And so I really hold those tensions um, at Mother's Day where I'm able to celebrate my mom and also celebrate other women, knowing that that's not taking anything away from me. Um, and then one of the things that I would say is be honest with your friends, be honest with your feelings. Don't feel like you have to hide or feel ashamed that you feel left out of that day, but express that to your friends. And I remember, um, 
my friends were the ones that reminded me that you too are mothering. And that was life giving for me um, on that particular day where my friends send me messages, um, happy Mother's Day because <laughs> you're mothering a generation or um, I, my goddaughter sends me a Mother's Day card. Those little touches, those little things um, mean a lot. And so if you are a mom and you have single friends in your life or you have, you know, moms that um that are divorced or widowed, um, make sure that you remember them this this year on Mother's Day um, and reach out, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a text, whether it's sending a, a gift card, um, just to remind them of how they're mothering. And one of the things I like to look at is, is just how um, we're supposed to celebrate each other. And the reason why we're doing that is we're imitating what Jesus did. And because Jesus he saw all women. So whether you were a woman that was, um, you know, that was had health issues, whether you were a woman that were um, that had an issue of blood or had been shamed, or had, you were a woman that was mourning or fearful um, or rejoicing, um, Jesus saw every woman that he encountered, despite any condition that she may have been in. And so what I would tell you to do as mothers and as women is to learn to celebrate each other, no matter what season of life you're in, no matter what condition, is that if we see each other, we know that we are connected and that we belong to each other. Hi sisters, I'm Timory and I'm a worship leader at Saddleback Church and it's a joy to be here with you. I join you today as one of you. Three years ago, I miscarried our first child. And while everybody's story is different, I'm familiar with the disappointment and the grief that comes with losing a child. You know, there's nothing quite like worship in times of pain to wash over us and comfort our hearts. There's nothing quite like the right song that says the thing your heart has been wanting to sing, that words themselves couldn't.
There are so many ways to lose a child. Sometimes a long and painful illness occurs. And sometimes an illness comes out of the blue and just as swiftly takes a child. Other times, violence is a part of a child's death and the layers of complexity in grieving become thicker, making it harder to process the death. And if losing a child to violence wasn't terrible enough, Mothers who lose children to murder or suicide bear a strange stigma on top of the crushing grief of losing their child. And sometimes dreadful, fatal accidents happen. In 2000, Mary Beth and Stephen Curtis Chapman had three biologic children, and they felt led to adopt a darling little girl from China named Shoei. Over the next couple of years, they went back to China, and they added Stevie Joy and Maria Sue to their growing family. But in 2008, there was a terrible accident involving their teenage son, Will Franklin, and Maria Sue. Listen to Mary Beth's story. Hey, everybody. I'm Mary Beth. Hey, Stephen Curtis Chapman here. How are you all doing? Good we to be with are you. so humbled um, that you all asked us to be yes. part of this Mother's mm-hmm. Day time. I would say Happy Thank Mother's you, Day. However, yes. I know that for many of you that we are talking to, Mother's Day seems to um, evoke a lot of sad, um, mm. just a lot of sad. And we've been asked to share a little bit of our story. Um, I know that many of you know our story because so many of you sitting in the room today have prayed for our family over mm. the past almost 12 years now. So um, May for us is a pretty big month. We have Mother's Day. We have our sweet Maria Sue, who is with Jesus. Her um, birthday is May 13th, always close to Mother's Day. And then her heaven day, as we like to call it, is May 21st when she went to be with Jesus, which was coming up on 12 years um, this month. So May evokes a lot inside of this mom and inside of my heart. And many of you are experiencing just loss of whether that's um, of a child, of your own mother, of a loved one, just so, so much, you know, Mother's Day. I remember being a little girl and we always got petunias on Mother's Day and we got to bring them home and plant them at church. And it was, it just always, yeah, my mom taught me how to deadhead the bloom. So there would be more blooms. (laughs) And Mother's Day is always supposed to just be this, such Mm. a happy time. And so many of us carry these deep, deep wounds of um, us and particularly the loss um, of a child. And, um, and also the pain that has been just around our family with um, our precious son, Will Franklin, and just all the all the pain that has come with that. And um, we've been asked to share a little bit of our story. Yeah. Um, I think as I've been thinking about it, 
I um, have been thinking a lot about it since I've had plenty of time to think because we're in the mid middle of this pandemic. Um, but Stephen always, my Tigger, has always reminded me that, <laughs> that God is good always. Jesus is good always. He is kind hearted towards us. He means us no harm. He is for us and he is with us. And that for me in my journey of losing my precious daughter, Maria, quite frankly, seems at times comical and maddening. And I shake my fist and I just want to just, you know, go, no, that's not true. How could that be true? Um, you know, my daughter is no longer with us. And how is that good and right towards us? And 12 years later, um, you know, people who have asked us to share our story, I would love to say that it is exponentially better. And it is not. It's not better. It's different. You know, we walk with a limp and we walk yeah. with this new normal. We hobble. We hobble well. We hobble our well. Son our son has said that we are <laughs> hobbling well. Um, mm -hmm. But we have seen, I always rest on, we have seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And that is how he has cared so exponentially well for our son, Will Franklin, and how he has healed wounds deep within my heart and Stephen's heart and our children's hearts. It's not that it's been easy and there is maddening, maddening days. And um, I liken it to a racetrack. It's like our, our month of of Maria's home going is May, like I said, and I feel like once May gets past us, we're on like a racetrack and it's okay for a while, but as we circle back around towards another May, it's like it gets different and it and sometimes it's heavier than other times. Sometimes we're able to celebrate her full life lived. We fully believe that she lived a full life because God had the days of her life numbered. Um, but sometimes it's just maddening to mm -hmm. wonder what it would be like to have her still with us. And so really, I'm just here as an encouragement that we're still together. Mm -hmm. Our family's together. Yeah. Um, sometimes I, <laughs> that's the, sometimes we, we talk about that, that when we have opportunities like this to share a bit of our story. And Mary Beth, I know, you know, wrestle, wrestles with this a lot. She shared her story beautifully in a book she wrote, Choosing to See, and um, is, is just honest and people have appreciated that so much uh, about my wife. I hear it. And when I do my concerts all the time, people are kind of like, you know, you're great and all, but can we meet Mary Beth? Cause she's really the one we want to meet. I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just here to, you know, just kind of hold her, you know, uh, you know <laughs> hold her purse or whatever, but, um, and happy to do so. But, but I think the honesty of that has been such a, a gift to so many, cause that's something that we don't always do so well in, in the church and in, in our Christian community, because we have this sense of, we need to have it together. We need to have, you know, we need to have the answers. And we've wrestled so much, especially being people, you know, in positions of, of influence. And, and I know it's something that Kay and Rick uh, have, you know, wrestled with of, as we've gotten a chance to share times with them and so thankful for uh, for Sweet Case, you know, honesty as well in, in her journey and, and both of those guys. And because I think just those, that is the reality that there's so much unanswered this side of heaven. There are answers we're just not going to get. And for us, I know for me, the Psalms became so much more real The to hear, you know, the psalmist not just going to those scriptures that we've written so many songs about of, you know, better is one day in your courts and your love is better than life and your loving kindness, you know, your is, you know, your your banner over me is love. But so many of those Psalms start with, How long, oh Lord? You know, are you gonna forget me forever? I mean, it's it's been such a blessing to us to see that scripture doesn't, that God never at any point says, Hey, get your act together before you come talking to me about your woes and your your frustrations and your anger. God apparently, from what I can read, says, bring it all. Pour well, your heart that's out good to me. News now, now, <laughs> he's always said, it's a good thing because uh, I'm have, not very good at, yes. at holding it back. But I'm but but I believe, you know, that is part of what has sustained us. That's part of what's held us together is that honesty. And it's ugly and it is sometimes really ugly, but but it's there's a beauty in that too, because we have come back over and over again to just say, you know, we, we're going to choose to trust, choose to see. The word see, uh, and I'll share just quickly, or maybe you would want to, because one of the things, you know, Kay had asked is there, were there certain things, you know, images or poems or, you know, songs, and I 
happen to play an occasional song and write a song here and there. So I'll play a song in a minute uh, of one of many, probably every song I've written since May of 2008 has a thread of Maria and our loss and our faith, you know, deepening trust and faith and the craziness um, is woven into all the songs I've written. But um, but one thing of, of several that God really did give us as a, you know, just a reminder, those, those tangible things that we become so desperate for. And God understands that and knows it. And we don't always get them nearly as much and as, as often as we want them or as quickly, but God really gave us a, a precious gift. And we both have shared a bit about it in, in the book that you wrote, the book that I wrote. Um, in fact, I think your cover of your book has the flower, Maria's flower. Uh, it's usually on the headstock of my guitar. I've got the wrong guitar or I would show you um, right there, but um, a you flower. You can show them your awesome oh, tattoo. I do, I do have an awesome <laughs> tattoo on my arm too of the flower, but I won't, I won't do that. Um, did he say that too? No. Um, but, uh, no, it's California. They're cool. Yeah, it's all cool. Um, but we, uh, the, the, uh, few days after, uh, the accident, uh, that took Maria to be with Jesus, we came home to get some clothes and gather some things for a memorial service. We were not staying at home for several days. It turned into, I guess, a couple of weeks, yep. maybe. But, um, I had gone into the kitchen where there was a little, we call them art tables where Maria and Stevie Joy, uh, her almost twin sister, just a few months apart, they kind of were like twins. They did everything together. Um, there were little little art table and there was one little piece of paper. They had been all cleaned up, but one piece of paper where Maria, that morning, we assume, had drawn her kind of signature picture. We find, we used to find it everywhere. Yeah, a six petal flower Yeah, with one petal colored in blue. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, it was just usually she colored them all kind of rainbow colors. She have different colors for each petal. And, you know, and she'd love to cut and glue. She loved glue because it was sticky and she loved all things sticky and um, glitter and glue and just make a mess. But she had drawn this picture and and it was a flower, but it wasn't finished. It only had the one petal of the six colored in blue. And then I noticed something because she had used markers and there was something bleeding through the paper that she had drawn on the back. And so I turned the paper over. Of course, immediately the flower and the tears and just, you know, that was Maria's signature, you know, flower and her picture. But then I turned it over and the back of the paper, there was one word and we'd never known her to write this word. She had just turned five. She just uh, was learning to write her name, Maria. And she'd write, I love mom and I love dad. She could write that. And she had written this word C S E E, and um, and then drawn a butterfly. There was a little butterfly right down beside it, and, and it wasn't like mm, on side mm. by side. It was like scooched over, so we actually were able to cut the paper. So I we know, had both yeah, sides of it, which is pretty amazing because we got it framed, of course, <laughs> in our house now. It's very special. But it wasn't until I mean, immediately the word C was so powerful for us because that had been a prayer sure. that we had been crying out to God, let us see something, let us see something that we know about faith, we're holding on by faith, but could you just give us something tangible? Is that too much to ask that we could see something? We're gonna trust you, we're gonna choose to trust you, but but could you give us something? And so for, for me to see that word and then see that flower and see the butterfly, which of course represents new life. And, and the word see, it just, it was immediately to me, like I could almost hear Maria, you know, just saying as I was reading the word, see, see, you know, it's, it's just like you said, it's just like you promised. It's just like God promised, you know, I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm better than good. I'm, I'm more alive than ever. And can you believe that? Can you see by faith, you know? And I, and, and, I, uh, and honestly, I took the flower too as the six petals. We have six children. Yeah, you and, figured um, this out because I, I wouldn't see this. We have six this. children and one pe petal is colored in blue and, um, and her petals finished. And so yeah, yeah. Um, we just figure she signed, hey, my pedal's finished. She left the word C for us. And um, yeah. and we call those bread breadcrumbs mm -hmm. and so many little things that um, we are choosing to see that God gave us these tangible little treasures um, in, in our story. And before Steve sings this song, one other really quick story is, um, it, which is, it, it it is written in the book, but just such an amazing, amazing story. Maria's Chinese name was Su Chung Sui. And Emily was living in Ireland at the time and was um, 
I had some friends in Ireland, what they would call Chinatown. And um, we took, she asked me one day for Maria's Chinese spelling of her name because we were going to get it translated. And um, she was going to see what her Chinese name actually meant. And um, as they were looking at the at the characters of her of her given name in China, um, her friends started to explain to her that um, her name literally means um, the winter is hard and frozen, but as as spring comes, you know the the water from the mountain starts to to melt and run away as as spring is coming. So basically, her friends looked at her and said her name means spring is coming. And Steve had already written the song for the album he did post Maria's death, just kind of his psalms of crying out to, you know, why did this happen? You know, su such deep, deep sad. And yet he had already written the song, Spring is Coming. And her name, y'all, actually means, the name given to her, not by us, but by um, the people caring for her in China before she was adopted, her name means Spring is Coming. And so God had this story planned before the beginning of time. I still don't like it. I am Maria's mom, and I yeah. am not going to like it all the way to heaven. I'm not going to like it. Um, but I am going to just resort back to believing that um, that Jesus is good and God is good. And while we don't understand and we can't fathom His goodness towards us and His reasonings for things. Um, and I know so many of you are hurting, and I don't understand your story like maybe you don't understand some of the aspects of my story. and. I would just say to you today, um, which, listen, Steve has found me under my bed, in my bed, in my closet, hiding every place, just railing against God and screaming out to Him. So I understand the depths of the tears and the depression and the hard that can come with losing someone that you love so dearly. But at the same time, I would just really, really admonish all of us to remember that God is loving kindness, that He that He that He is making all things new. And while we can't understand it this side of the brokenness and the fall, we are gonna see it. We're gonna see it. And um, I'm just really grateful that Maria left yes. us that word that we're gonna see, yeah. that we're gonna see it yeah. made right and and it's gonna be beyond anything we can imagine. So please be encouraged, hold on to that, hold hope. On to that yeah. hope. I know, I know that I know that mm. I know how hard um, it is. And again, not gonna pretend to understand your story, but I can certainly speak from the pain of my own story. So be encouraged, spring is mm. coming. Amen. I'm not letting go of this hope I have That tells me spring is coming Spring is coming And all we've been hoping and longing for Soon will be is coming spring is coming it won't be long now it's just about start to sing Feel the life in the breeze Watch 
Once the ice melts away The kids are coming out to play Feel the sun on your skin It's growing strong and warm again Once the ground There's something moving Something is breaking through New life is breaking through Spring is coming Spring is coming And all we've been hoping and longing for Soon will be God bless y'all. Thanks for letting us be with you. Several women today have used the word see and the difficulty that they have had in seeing what God is doing in their pain and grief and in the waiting, the disappointments, the lack of healing or fulfilling the dreams held deeply in their hearts. But they've also talked about the gradual awakening to the ability to see God at work. Priscilla talked about how she was numb from the loss of seven people dear to her, including her mother. She said, I can't see all that God is doing right now, but I believe I will. Don Cherie said that she could see that the waiting season was not a wasted season. Karen said, I couldn't see a future without children, but trusted God, and it made me more compassionate, and I learned to see how he used my pain. Latasha said, will I see the future I had planned for myself? I'm not sure, but I see you, other women. I see you the way Jesus did, and you matter. Mary Beth said, I had to choose to see the goodness of God in the land of the living in the middle of the tragic accident that affected Will Franklin and took Maria Sue to heaven. She said, I believe that spring is coming, and I will finally see. In Genesis chapter 16 is a story of Hagar, an abused woman. You can look it up for yourself, but she is thrown out of her home and she is left out in the desert. And in the desert, she sees an angel of God. He comes and he speaks to her and she recognizes that it was God. And from then on, she calls God the God who sees me. She says, for I have seen the one who sees me. He is the God who sees and knows your suffering. He doesn't always give us the miracle that we long for. Our mothers die. Our babies don't live out of the womb or they don't grow up. We don't get the miracle of being able to conceive. Maybe we don't marry and have the family that we wanted. Sometimes horrible accidents happen and children have mental illness and in their lives. Sometimes we don't get the miracle. We don't get the victory the fulfillment that we've been praying for here. Sometimes the greatest miracle is truly what happens on the inside of us in our relationship of trust and faith in God who sees what we cannot see and in the ways we take our suffering and instead of letting it shrivel our souls, we move outward in passionate compassion for others who suffer, inviting them to walk with us on a path that includes both sorrow and hope. It's really all about surrender. 
the willingness to believe. See, even if you're not sure that you believe, if you're willing to believe, God can be trusted and he can be trusted with your sorrow and your loss. If you can begin to believe he's working in you, even when you can't see it, that you will find peace. Not that you'll ever like suffering. I mean, we're not masochists. It's, it's nothing like, oh, I love suffering. That's ridiculous. I'm going to miss Matthew every day of my life until the day I see him again when I see Jesus face to face. But being willing to believe that God will give you a crown of beauty for the ashes of your losses and sorrows, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, and eventually, festive praise instead of despair. I want you to listen to this. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. But right now, right now I'm losing back. I stood on this stage night after night Reminding the broken it'll be alright Right now, oh right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down What will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? Well, I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. What well, good thing a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength. To be able to say it is well with my soul I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is yours alone And I know the sorrow and I know the hurt Go away if you just say the word But even if you don't My hope is you alone You've been faithful You've been good All my days Jesus, I will cling to Come what may, cause I know you're able And I know you can Oh, oh, oh I know you're able And I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone Just say the word, but even if you don't. 
I invite you to intentionally join a community of beautiful women who share their sorrow and their hope, who can help each other find strength in God. Latasha and Don Cherie mentioned this. They spoke of community. They said you cannot grieve well by yourself. Part of grieving well is finding other kindred women who have or are journeying on the path that you're taking. Beautiful grieving women, we can wipe each other's tears. We can hold each other's grief. And we can gently remind each other that God's not finished yet. And even if our hope is in Him alone, because Jesus is only good, and not for a moment, not for a single moment, will He forsake us or abandon us to despair. Spring is coming. That eternal spring that our souls long for on that glorious resurrection day, it's coming and we will finally see. Let me pray for us. If you have a candle, I suggest, if you'd like to, that you might want to light it just in memory of someone that you love and have lost, or in the hopes that some of the dreams that you've been longing for, that you'll see. Father, I pray again for my sisters. I pray for those that we have lost. I thank you that Matthew is in your presence, that my mom is in your presence. I don't have to worry or wonder where they are. I know that they are with you. And I look forward to that day. God, I want to see. I want to see clearer than I do here. And I realize that some of what I want to see, I'm not going to see here. Help me to wait patiently for that glorious resurrection day when all sad things become untrue and all that I've, everything that I've longed for will be realized in your presence. And we use just this simple, tangible reminder to think about those that we have loved and lost. And we think about the unrealized and unrecognized dreams that we're still waiting for. And may the candle and the flickering flame remind us of that hope. You're so good to us, and we do trust you. Help us to not hold back in sharing our grief with each other, to not be ashamed of it or embarrassed by it, or feel like we should be over it or past it. I pray that we will help each other recognize that we really do belong together, that we can grieve together, and that we can hope together. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. To help you process your grief, we've created some resources we think you're going to find helpful. So please go to the link in the comments below. You'll find downloadable scripture cards, a beautiful bookmark that you can cut out and laminate if you want to. There's some coloring pages that that our team has created They're not taken out of a book. These are hand created for you. There's an interactive breath prayer video and even a how-to watercolor video. If you would like to express your grief by learning how to watercolor some of it, there's a little how-to video there for you. And there's also information for how to find a support group and book recommendations to help bring you comfort in your journey. Thank you, beautiful women, for joining us at Belladonna.